G'day, I'm Martin Isles, and this is The Truth of It. And today's episode is dedicated to being something of a wake-up call. And to that end, it's quite sober. Uh, it is at times fairly confronting. It has to be. Actually, the truth is, it's realistic, and probably that's the best way to put it. In recent days, I have said a lot uh, of things about the change in suppression conversion practices Prohibition Bill 2020, which is before the Victorian Parliament right now. The Andrews government has introduced it. I have said that, for example, it is the biggest attack on religious freedom, and I think freedom of speech, that this country has ever seen. I've said that it would make the Soviets blush. I've said that it would put people like me in jail. I've said that it will certainly see criminal action against Christian parents. I've said that it would have the effect of outlawing the Bible and the teaching of the Bible. I've said all of these things and more, but I appreciate that people become skeptical when you say things with force like that. And so today, I'm not so much asking you to take my word for it. Instead, we're going to step through the words of the bill itself. And here it is. I have it in this black binder. The entire bill, every page and we're going to run through it. And to that end, I'm going to go straight to the guts of the bill so you can hear it for yourself, section by section. And section five is the key one, meaning of change or suppression practice. The bill is uh, the change and suppression practices prohibition bill. So what is it prohibiting a change and suppression practice? Here's the meaning of that phrase. And it says this, in this act, a change or suppression practice means a practice or conduct directed towards a person, whether with or without the person's consent for the purpose of, or it says on the basis of their gen sexual orientation, gender identity, and for the purpose of, one, changing or suppressing the sexual orientation or gender identity of the person, or two, inducing the person to change or suppress their sexual orientation or gender identity. So let's step that out. Firstly, the act bans Conduct, so practice or conduct. Conduct's the widest. What does conduct include? Literally any action whatsoever by anyone. Conduct is a very, very broad word. And specifically, it is conduct that is directed towards a person with or without the person's consent. So in other words, it makes no difference if somebody requests it. A person cannot voluntarily seek out the things that this bill prohibits, and you cannot respond to them if they do. Now. It goes on from there to specifically say for the purpose of those things, changing or suppressing or inducing the person to change or suppress. Okay, we're gonna go through some case studies and see if they satisfy those criteria in just a minute, but let me make some further observations. The very next section, 5.2, makes it very, very clear that this is a one-way street. This bill does not apply to any conduct that seeks to change or induce a change to a homosexual orientation or to a transgender identity. It doesn't apply to assisting a person to transition in those directions. It doesn't apply to conduct that is pro-LGBT. It only applies to conduct that is of a Christian view on these matters. That's clear. It's ideological. It's imbalanced. Um, Section 5.3, which follows again, gives some specific examples of conduct that definitely is included in that definition that I just read out before. And it says that, you know, conduct is includes but isn't limited to. So it's just giving some examples and it's making the point there's lots of others. But in these some examples that it gives, I draw your attention to this. It includes carrying out a religious practice, including but not limited to a prayer-based practice. Religion and prayer are specifically, prayer is specifically included as an example of prohibited illegal conduct under this definition. Also it says, it includes, but isn't limited to, giving a person a referral for the purposes of a change or suppression practice being directed to the person. So in other words, if you say, go and speak to Joe, go and speak to Bob, go and speak to someone who's had a similar experience to you or been on a similar journey, no, that also is criminal, that also is prohibited, you cannot refer them on to somebody else. 
the explanatory notes of the bill actually go further and they say that it is intended to capture a broad range of conducts. They're emphasising breadth and the objects clause of the bill in section 3 is the same. Uh, they emphasise the breadth, it says including informal practices and including conversations with a community leader that encourage change or suppression. So a conversation about celibacy, right? Suppression. This is intended to include all of that stuff really wide. I mentioned the objects clause. It actually says that the bill's purpose, among other things, includes making sure that LGBT people feel welcome and valued in Victoria and are able to live authentically and with pride. So anything that can be seen as derogating from that pride standard uh, and that welcoming and valued standard, so total affirmation of everything, falls short within the objects clause of this bill. In other words, it's outside, in other words, um, the bill is intended to capture it and make it unlawful. Um, now, section eight of the bill, which follows from the other sections I've just been reading, makes this important point. A lot of people say, well, I'm glad I'm not in Victoria. Oh, Victoria, add it again. Not so fast. Section eight is titled extraterritorial application. This section applies if a person engages in conduct outside Victoria. This act has effect in relation to that conduct as if it had been engaged wholly within Victoria if a significant part of the conduct occurs in Victoria or the conduct occurred wholly outside Victoria but the effects of the conduct occurred wholly or partly in Victoria. So people in Sydney, people in Perth, people in Udnadatta, people in Alice Springs, people on the Sunshine Coast, I can tell you this, if you say something that is heard or consumed, like content on the internet or whatever, by people who are in Victoria, or you're doing things that someone in Victoria encounters, hears, or comes into contact with, you too are doing something illegal under the terms of this act. This is not just about Victoria. That's really important to get straight. This has national implications. That's why I said, I don't live in Victoria. I said this bill would send people like me to jail. I mean that, I live outside Victoria. But this clause means that this very video, you know, going into Victorian listeners is a big problem for me under the terms of this bill. Now, I wanna go back to the definition I read out before and just quickly see whether we can actually do a case study. For example, let's take a pastor. Let's call him Jim. Let's say that he's just preached a sermon on Christian marriage uh, and within it, that was a discussion of Christian sexual ethics and saying, you know, you should abstain outside of marriage. Marriage is one man, one woman. Uh, you know, uh, the homosexual option is not God's plan. It's not right. They read from Ephesians 5. They read from Romans 1, etc. Totally bog standard sermon on the issue. A new member of the church, and let's call him Adrian, approaches Pastor Jim afterwards and tells Pastor Jim that he sometimes feels attracted to other men, but that he really wants, first and foremost, to follow God's will for his life. He wants, actually, to be married to a woman, to be a family man one day. He asks if Pastor Jim would pray for him. Pastor Jim puts his hand on Adrian's shoulder, says a prayer, assures Adrian that he's available for any support he needs, and affirms that what he is seeking to do is a very good thing. First, was it conduct? Remember the definition? Was it conduct? Of course it was. Um, in fact, it was one of those conducts, is that a word? One of those actions was conduct specifically within, uh, named within the bill. Prayer, as an example, if you recall. Second, was it directed towards a person? Of course it was. Third, was it on the basis of that person's sexual orientation or gender identity? Yes, arguable in the first, definitely in the second. But I think in the first, very arguable because the sermon was partly about that issue. Fourth, was it the, uh, for the purpose of inducing a person to change or suppress their sexual orientation or gender identity? Well, yes, it was. I mean, Pastor Jim is hoping that the things he's saying will be taken seriously. Pastor Jim is hoping that he's teaching people to do the right thing. And that's what he wants the outcome to be. Of course it was for that reason. This is, and he says, you know, God's will is this. God's approval rests on this kind of behavior. There you go. He's inducing someone to heteronormative living. Fifth, does it matter that it was with Andrew's consent? Does it matter that Andrew requested, oh, Adrian, sorry, I'm getting my names mixed up. Does it matter that it was with Adrian's consent or that Adrian requested it? Makes no difference. Remember, it said conduct with or without the person's consent. The sermon alone satisfies the criteria. The prayer alone satisfies the criteria. That is criminal, that is potential criminality, that is illegal conduct. Under the specific terms of this bill that I just read to you, it's straightforward, it's not complex, it's not unclear, it's not in doubt. That's what the bill says. Or take this alternative scenario. What if the sermon was delivered in Sydney? What if Pastor Jim lives in Sydney? 
And what if he posts his sermons online? And, and Adrian discovers this sermon on the church website and he's living in Melbourne. Um, or maybe he had an email exchange with Pastor Jim rather than a conversation. Pastor Jim's actions are still illegal. Pastor Jim is still captured under this bill. It doesn't matter where he lives. It could have been from Darwin. It doesn't matter. Well, what about this alternative scenario? What if Pastor Jim said to Andrew, you know, this just isn't my area. I don't know a lot about it. I know what the Bible says, but in terms of specific support, I actually know a guy who's been on the same journey as you, and maybe he'd be helpful. Here's his email address. Ah, again, doesn't matter whether he did that by email from another city or whether he did it in person in Victoria. Again, it's prohibited conduct. In fact, it's one of the specifically listed examples of prohibited conduct under this bill. This is the summary. Sermons and prayers are illegal. They could indeed be criminal. They could result in jail. So the Bible itself induces a person to change their sexual orientation, sexual orientation or gender identity. That's what it says. It says, hey, there's sanctification of the Christian life, and this is what happens. This is the kind of change, 1 Corinthians 6. What does that mean for reading that, for selling that book? What does that mean for any number of things? Or what about parents? Well, I'm glad you asked, because the bill includes an amendment to the Family Violence Protection Act 2008 in Section 64 of the bill. It's towards the end. Section 64 of the bill uh, includes the following. It, it inserts the following specific example of emotional or psychological abuse into the Family Violence Protection Act. And here's the example. An adult child repeatedly denigrating an elderly parent's sexual orientation, including by telling them it is wrong to be same-sex attracted and that they must change or the adult child will no longer support them. Now you immediately see that's a weird example. When do you get that from a child to a parent? You don't really. But of course the example is included because if it's in there, it automatically, it by extension, it logically applies in reverse. This is the deception of it. What they really would like the example to say is a parent who doesn't approve the sexual orientation or gender identity of their child with full affirmation that parent is actually a psychological abuser. Now, the way they've worded it there, no Christian parent, I hope, would denigrate their child. No Christian parent I know would, would, would say they don't support their child. But every Christian parent I know just about would certainly say, well, here's the standard of right and wrong, and that's what we believe. And they'd encourage it in the home. Uh, well, I'm glad you asked. All of a sudden, parents are in trouble under the terms of this bill. Not to mention, apart from that little section, this definition in section five, you know, their conduct towards a person, blah, blah. There's no exception here for parents. There's no exception here for medical practitioners. There's no exception here for religious practitioners. It's just blanket. So parents are definitely included. In fact, every Christian parent under this bill has been made into emotional and psychological abusers of their children. And note that there's nothing said about the age of the child, a four-year-old. And we're not just talking about mature minors. We're talking about all children, all parents. Other examples abound. You can think of them, health practitioners who search for underlying causes when gender dysphoric children come to see them. And they say, well, is there psychosis? Is there mania? Is there depression? Is there sexual abuse? You know, maybe actually in your case, I don't think that full affirmation is the right way to go. I think there's a good chance you'll grow out of this. The statistics say that there are a good chance that you'll grow out of this. You wouldn't want to do irreversible life-changing surgery at your age or hormones at your age, which cannot be reversed. Uh, you know, you wouldn't want to do that. Oh, they're not affirming, are they? They run dangerously close to running foul of this bill. Or ex-LGBT people who offer support to other ex-LGBT people. There's plenty of those people. In fact, this bill erases a whole class of LGBT people by telling them that the state knows better than they do because there's a whole class who say, well, actually, I'm a Christian first or I'm a person of faith first, and that's more important to me, and I want to live that way. Well, this bill says, no, no, you can't get any help about that and you can't be taught that. Uh, you, you, you can't get what you want. It doesn't matter if it's voluntary, it's all wrong. They erase that class of people, this bill does, and pretends they don't exist, and they do exist. There's a lot of them. Christian schools, codes of conduct and behavioural standards, or a youth group's code of conduct and behavioural standards. Is that inducing someone to change? Probably, because they're saying, well, you can have membership here, you can attend this school, you can go to this youth group, if you abide by this code of conduct. Well, that's a problem, potentially, isn't it? The prohibition extends actually to ideas of abstinence and celibacy because that's suppression, not allowing them to fully live out their sexual persuasions. Um, this extends to the things that I've said in my videos about Christian teaching on the subject. Um, and that's not even the end, you know, worryingly, and I don't know how this, whether this would ever um, end up in court, but it's a possibility under the terms of this bill because the definition of sexual orientation is such that um, it includes heterosexual people. 
So suppressing heterosexual conduct, as in with celibacy, abstinence and this kind of thing, is that running foul of the bill? On the strict terms of that definition, it looks likely. Now, I don't know if that would ever be brought as a case, but it just shows how unbelievably broad the bill actually is. Every conversation on this subject is affected, even private conversations, even consensual conversations, every action done in relation to this subject, every Bible verse about this subject, every Christian institution with a code of conduct, every counsellor, doctor, teacher, pastor, parent, foster carer, every average Joe is affected by this. Every conversation, every written word, every book, every website, every parent, every leader, every friend, every author, all are affected by this. And by the way, what this bill does is it makes crimes and it puts in place fines and criminal penalties, sections 10 and 11. Section 10 is the first offence that is set up by this bill. And what it says is that if you do these things and it causes serious injury, then you are going to jail for 10 years uh, or you're being fined $200,000. Or section 11 says if you do these things and it causes injury, not serious injury, but injury, then uh, you can go to jail for five years and receive a $100,000 fine. Or in both cases, both of those things can happen. You can go to jail and be fined in both cases. Now, this is where apologists for the bill will say that I'm being alarmist, because for jail terms to result, for this kind of punishment to result, there needs to be injury. Injury. But I want to make this important point. What is injury? According to section four of this bill in the definitions, injury has the same meaning as that in the Crimes Act, which includes temporary injury, so it includes temporary stuff that doesn't last, and it includes harm to mental health on a temporary basis. Now, there will be no problem whatsoever getting a rainbow flag waving counsellor or a shrink of some kind to say that somebody's anguish of, over their LGBT identification has been exacerbated by something said in a church or a prayer, pray, a prayer prayed by a person or a rule laid down by a parent or a line in a book or a course of treatment from a medical professional or something that they were told by a friend or an advertisement for counselling support or anything else. There'll be no problem finding that. To get somebody who is in a professional capacity in the medical profession to say, yes, this caused temporary mental injury or contributed to temporary mental injury in my client, in, in, in my patient. And straight away you blow open the whole suite of criminal sanctions that this bill outlines. But it's not just that, you know. The last point I'll make is this. Jail does not have to be involved. The bill empowers the ideologues and the Equal Opportunity Commission to investigate, sections 34 and 35, to demand the production of information or documents, section 36, to impose remedies on people and organisations, section 32 and 33. It permits the Commission to refer matters to the police, section 29. Of course, it's, these are criminal offences, so you'd imagine. It permits anyone at all to complain whether or not they're affected, section 24. It permits their identity to remain secret, section 40, and the content of their complaint to remain secret, section 41. You can also be summoned to the Commission and made to give an answer for yourself. Section 37, you can be forced into a, legal binding, a legally binding agreement of pretty much any kind to remedy or make reparation for the things that you do in Division 4. So this will result in stressful, protracted investigations which could involve, honestly, police knocking at your door, uh, which could involve you being forced to give up whatever documents the Commission wants, whatever information the Commission wants from you, which will be conducted with the threat of jail hanging over your head and which can be done in secret. And that will be one of the real weapons of this bill. In fact, they are empowered to produce educational materials. And I forgot to include here, actually, there's a section in there that says they can re-educate. So they can come and try and re-educate you. I mean, like I said at the start, this would make the Soviets blush. And like I said at the start, don't take my word for it. I have substantially read to you from this bill to show you what it says. I'm not kidding. There it is. Welcome to Daniel Andrews, Victoria. And now, given that it has extra uh, outside of the state application, um, welcome to Daniel Andrews, Australia. This bill needs to be fought with everything we've got. We're not making it up. That was, in fact, the truth of it about the Change and Suppression Conversion Practices Prohibition Bill 2020. 
All right, next up, I've been talking to you about the Victorian bill, which is banning so-called conversion therapy. And just to see why that is such a tremendous problem, go back and watch section one of this episode on the bill uh, and find out for yourself what the bill says. I just walked it through. It's hair raising. It would indeed make the Soviets blush. But I'm not done with the subject. I want to make another segment here. And I want to give you two real life examples. Two real life examples of people who stand to lose more than words can say if this bill passes. And you're going to see what I mean. The first one actually came from a friend of mine who is a former transgender person. He helps others who, like him, undergo an irreversible transition process only to realise that they have made a terrible mistake. And he helps people who are at their very lowest and at their very loneliest. He's a tremendous man and he's got amazing friends because of the work that he has done. And he forwarded to me just the other day one of the hundreds and hundreds of emails that he receives continually from people who are in this awful situation. And I want to say this, brace yourselves. This is not easy reading. Um, I can't read it all because it is simply too graphic at times. But I am going to give it a crack to read as much as I can because I want you to see what is in fact the greatest, one of the greatest humanitarian crises in this country right now. There is a tsunami of people like this and they are silenced, they are erased, they are not talked about and laws are about to be passed which make helping them and their seeking of that help criminal offences punishable by jail terms, as I just described in the last segment in great clarity. Let me read you this awful story. He says this, he says, Hello, I watched your video on YouTube. I too have regret medically transitioning and it seems to be a very censored and somewhat controversial topic and opinion, which is wrong. I haven't had SRS, which is sex reassignment surgery, only HRT, which is hormone replacement therapy. But that's enough to make me wish I was dead. I'm poor and on a pension for disability and wish nothing more than to have a flat chest again and my penis working again. My sex drive is gone and so is my confidence. I mentioned I'm on a pension because I desperately want breast removal surgery so bad it's not funny but can't afford it. I'm trying to find a way to get funding for it here in Australia to prevent me doing it myself. Now I don't know if I mentioned this is a young man who has gone on the hormone therapy to transition to become a woman. Uh, but I can't afford it. I'm trying to find a way to get funding here in Australia to prevent me from doing it myself. I'm seriously going to cut my rib sides with a scalpel and tear my breast tissue out if I can't get help and then stitch it back up with fishing twine. My name is Andy. That's not actually his name, but we'll go with it. By the way, I'm 26 and I've been on potent birth control pills and have serious regret. I can't look at myself without an extra large t-shirt. Even with that, it's still hard. I feel like a human mannequin. It's warped what I'm going through. The reason behind it is that since young, I always wanted a girlfriend and got rejected and rejected and rejected. So I decided to turn myself into my own girlfriend. And now that I'm not gay or ugly, I could get a girlfriend, but they are put off by my past transgenderism. SRS, that's sex reassignment surgery, remember, should be illegal. It's torture, I imagine. And lab made hormones only destroyed my body. I hate what I've done to myself and can't find a gram of support anywhere and need someone to talk to. I'm being called a transphobe, totally shunned by the LGBT community. I'm straight anyway, so I don't care, like whatever. Now I'm going to skip a bit here, it's just too explicit. He talks about his physiology, it's dreadful, but I, I just can't read it. Um, he, he continues, I want my body back. All I needed was to be skinny, which I got weight dysmorphia mixed up with gender. I'm skinny now and that makes me happy at least. I need to know there is light at the end of the tunnel and I'm not stuck like this forever. Doctors are evil and the whole world is going along with this nonsense. I don't deserve this. Nobody does. What can I do to get my body back? This was a big mistake. How will I find a wife? I'm completely sterile and no fertility whatsoever. No counsellors to talk to. I'm an inch away from ending my life and need to reach out. I was 21 when I started HRT and regret nothing more. I cry every night to suicide helpline, but it isn't enough. I want these breasts gone and my genitals to work again. 
I've ruined my life over a stupid decision made by a stupid young adult, me. I had no idea what I was signing up for. I would really appreciate your reply or any kind words on the matter. I feel sorry for anyone going through this mess, which will be millions, by the way. The world is going, by the way, the world is going. Anyways, I appreciate your good work. Keep going with it, as it will help a lot of people. Anyway, take care. That young man is an Australian. He is here, now, living among us. He is one of thousands who have contacted my friend on this matter. He is part of the great tsunami of young people called transgender regretters. I recently received a message myself from a woman who works uh, on a mental health and suicide helpline, and she said that she gets calls like this fairly often. If the Andrews government passes this bill, which is likely, then even her support, that lady on the phone, of a young man like Andy, who I just read out, will be illegal on threat of prison. My friend who sent me this email, who helps these people by the truckload and is a wonderful person, will be threatened with 10 years in jail, even for advertising his service. If this is not pure evil, then nothing is. Notice that this story was from someone who had only been on hormone therapy. I fear sometimes we think that hormone therapy is a minor evil. It is a very great one. It is an irreversible therapy. And that brings me to my second story of someone who stands to lose more than words can say from this bill. And this was reported this last week by Bernard Lane in The Australian. It's an Australian mother and father who had their 15-year-old child removed from their custody by child protection authorities because they would not consent to her receiving hormone therapy. And you can see why after I read that. Um, the Lane reports that the parents favour instead non-invasive psychotherapy for their child, saying that they believe factors other than gender, including loss of friends, lack of social skills and a difficult start to puberty, may explain the mental and emotional distress. By the way, they are her parents. They are probably best placed than anyone to make that judgement and to know that. But the child was put under a protection order by authorities who judged that the parents were abusive for failing to embrace her self-declared gender identity to the extent of permitting hormone therapy. And a judge, that is an agent of a state, will be asked to approve the hormone therapy soon, uh, whilst both parents remain opposed, and the lawyer, to make this happen, will be supplied by state-funded legal aid. In an affidavit to child... Uh, in an affidavit, uh, a child protection worker noted that the parents hold Protestant Christian views, um, but the parents say that they didn't know about their daughter's feelings or that she was suicidal because it played out online in pro-transgender Facebook groups. Now, this is really common. Uh, I've learned about this from other parents who had similar difficulties, where they say their kids have these activists come into the school, do great presentations to them and do a whole lot of great PR about how good it is to be trans, and then they go away, and what do the kids do? They follow them on Facebook, they join the Facebook groups, and they start talking in the groups, apart from their parents, and they get pulled away. And that I've heard this story a few times, and I'm just hearing it again here in the Australian newspaper in relation to this case, and that's what the parents say happened in this case. And she went to the emergency department, and a day after arrival, there was a sign on her room declaring a new male name in her local ch children's hospital. When the mother asked to talk to the teenager, she said that the nurse forgot to mute the phone and asked her daughter, will they use your correct pronouns? My daughter said, no, I don't think so. And then the nurse said, Oh, then, you don't want to speak to them. What should I tell them? Doesn't that make your blood boil? Who does she think she is? Unreal. Now, the gender, uh, the gender clinic at this children's hospital in question has seen more than a 700% increase in patients in five years. And a nurse at the hospital told the father that she could not think of a single case in which a child was rejected for treatment. This is ideology. And it's, as I said, causing the tsunami of people like Andy, whose story I read just a moment ago. And I say again, Daniel Andrews is seeking to pass laws that will make these parents not just psychological abusers, but jailable criminals. And meanwhile, the gender-affirming medical establishment and their colleagues, and by the way, it's not all doctors, there's a huge undercurrent of dissent on this, but they're afraid to speak because the medical board will come after them. Um, meanwhile, they're protected the medical establishment who pushed this stuff. Do you know, I believe that the transgender issue is one of the very greatest humanitarian crises of our day. 
Children's lives are being totally and completely destroyed en masse over something for which there is no scientific evidence and which remains the subject of much debate. And the law is starting to criminalise dissent. It is starting to criminalise dissent to such a degree that many of us are facing the prospect of jail. And yet it's interesting to me to observe silence on this issue. A few have spoken, a few, and I'm very grateful for that and I think that's great and full credit to those, but many have shut their mouths. There are organisations in this country who claim that they stand for freedoms and exist to protect freedoms. And this is the moment that they were established to prevent, and yet they are too terrified so far to say a word. There are Christian leaders as well, and many Christian leaders have done a great job, and I'm not against Christian leaders, don't get me wrong, but many who haven't said a word, too concerned about being liked, too asleep to say things. And, you know, I'm very grateful to the small number that have, but. I think it's timely that we remember something. Silence speaks volumes. A friend of mine told me on the phone this week, silence speaks volumes, and he referred me to this very important scripture in 1 Kings 18, 21. It says this, Elijah went up to the people and said, how much longer will it take you to make up your minds? If the Lord is God, worship him. But if Baal is God, worship him. But the people didn't say a word. Silence in that case spoke volumes. And I am afraid that the silence today speaks volumes. Choose who you will serve, the God of LGBT or submitting to their fear and submitting to their reign of you know, what they do which is to suppress and to silence and all the rest of it. Are you going to submit to that or are you going to do something greater and do the right thing? This is a crucial, crucial moment. I say again, silence speaks volumes. Okay. I've got no notes this morning, but I, there's some things I definitely want to address in this situation. Like I say, for me, I think we're at a crossroads in Western civilization as to where we're going to go. There's a scripture here in the uh, book of Amos, if you've got it. Uh, book of Amos, which, you, you know, has never really made a great deal of sense and you don't think it can happen. Uh, and I can't find Amos. There it is, Amos, chapter 8. I think it's verse 11. Okay, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, where I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, not a th nor of thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Now, what we see happening in Western civilization, I can only describe, and I would go on record as saying, I believe Daniel and and Andrews, at the very least, is demonically animated and very possibly demonically possessed, because this is satanic what's going on. And we can see that it's satanic and that the spiritual forces that are at work in the world today are all moving in the same direction. There's no reason for the same week that Norwegian, uh, Nor Norway passes this very same legislation that Daniel Anders is trying to propose under cover of you know, being anti-torture, which there's no torture happening in Australia. What are you talking about? This is satanic. This is demonic. And so what God says is the days are coming where my word is going to be like a famine, where you're scratching around trying to find a feed. What's he saying? He's saying this book and the ideology that's in this book will be illegal. They will not tolerate it, and that's the legislation that's coming out now. They say you can hold any sort of thing. I'm now a gender ostrich. I'm a gender monkey. I'm now a gender female, now I'm a male, now I'm, now I'm this, now I'm that, now I'm a donkey, now I'm this. No, you can be any insanity that you like, but what you cannot be is dogmatic that there's a truth that exists in this world that this book reveals to me, and they will not accept that point of view. They will accept any point of view except this one. And what we're going to is, what right has the government of the land got to tell you what you can talk about in your house? What right has the government that's in place in your country that's supposed to represent your views got to tell you about what you say to your children? That's a God-given relationship. You're to bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The state is, according to scripture, is supposed to be a terror to evildoers. But what do we have going on? Evildoers running amok going through the court system. We'll give you a 50 hours community service. They don't even turn up for the community service. They just come and, and tear your goods out again, pinch your car, go and steal your TV out of your lounge room, all this sort of stuff. 
They're not a terror to anyone. What right? There's no scriptural right for them or basis to tell you how to bring up your children. That's a God-given right for you to speak in that way to your children. And they're, they're usurping these rights. This is satanic. Everything that exalts itself uh, as God, he, this thing, this satanic antichrist spirit will usurp that authority. And that's where we are. That's what's happening. What is going on in the world? Let's have a look. Let's turn to the book of Jeremiah, I think it is. And we'll start in, verse, uh, in chapter 25, if you've got it. There's only one explanation in my head for what is going on. And it's found in these scriptures. There's two scriptures or three that I've got today that I want to address. But here we go. Chapter 25. And we're going to start in Jeremiah 25. And let's start, um, let's start in verse 15 because that's really what I want to address. Jeremiah 25 and verse 15. What's going on here? For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me. Okay. Jeremiah, keep in mind, he is the one before Babylon comes for captivity. Okay, so the picture is very strong prophetically of Jeremiah because in Revelation it's the, the, the woman on the beast, Babylon, Babylon is fallen, okay? So it's coming into the captivity of Babylon. So the words of Jeremiah are very, very strong for us. If you haven't read the book of Jeremiah, read it. It applies for what's happening today. They were going into captivity with the same Babylon wickedness, adultery spirit, this adulterous deception. That was all going on. So Jeremiah is speaking to his day, speaking to the days when Jesus came, and speaking primarily for ultimate fulfillment in our day that's coming. Okay? So Jeremiah 25, 15. It says this, Take this wine cup of the fury from my hand, and cause all nations to whom I send you to drink it. This cup is of the Lord, right? But it's filled with his judgments, filled with his fury. What does it do? And they will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Can I tell you what is coming? We're in the midst of madness. No government in, in 500 years has passed laws like we're pushing to get through. Even sane, atheist, God-hating men never went this far. Yet we are going into complete and utter madness is where we're going. Let's turn again to Jeremiah 51. Jeremiah 51. And once again he's talking about, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon, etc., and against their archer, bender, bow, and um, here it is in verse 6. Let's start from there. Flee from the midst of Babylon. Listen, if we're Christians, we're true Christians, don't get disheartened. There's only a few of us here. Mate, that's less that can dob you into the authorities. I'm just trying to be honest because if things get tough, you have Christians in your midst that are a bit wonky wavy. You know who sold out the church? Who was from within the church? They sell you out every time. It's those true Christians get sold out by the established church. And so um, I'm trying to ask the Lord, how come, how come, how come about numbers? But it may be a blessing that we've got faithful people here that are serious about the Word of God. Uh, that may be a blessing coming in the days to come. Who knows? Anyway, so let's go. Verse 6. From the midst of Babylon and everyone save his life. Get out of this apostate thing. Don't, do not be cut off of her iniquity for the time of the Lord's vengeance he shall recompense her. Listen, God's judgment is coming quickly here. <coughs> what day is this? Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand. They made all the... So it's the same cup in the Lord's hand, but it's given to these nations, to the nations Babylon, to drink this thing. And they made all the earth drunk, and the nations drunk her wine. Therefore the nations are deranged, or the word that's in there in, other, in older translations is the same word. They're made mad. And then suddenly Babylon falls. But there's a time of madness that comes on here. Okay, there's a time. This thing is of the Lord. There's a madness that is creeping across the world. And I'm asking the Lord now, is your restrainer being removed? Is it coming further back? We're getting close. I honestly think we're getting close here to the time of the Lord. Is this restrainer getting pulled back and this wickedness? Has the Lord already filled the cup of his fury and lit the fuse on the bomb and put it in the hands of the world's leaders and said, you drink this thing. 
because they are making mad decisions. We've got people in the US where we've got footage, every vote's to be, um, to be looked at by observers from the Republican and, and the Democratic side. We've got footage in Georgia of them pulling suitcases out from under uh, tables that are hidden over with, with uh, tablecloths and counting them for, for th four of them. They expelled everyone from the room. Oh, so tired, need to go home. Oh, yeah, and four of them stayed behind. You can watch it yourself. Everyone goes home. Then they pull out these hidden secret suitcases from out under this tablecloth and they begin pushing ballots through to one in the morning until the Republicans who thought, mate, someone's told me there's some there's lights on here, and they come back, and that's how they knew that they were in there doing this thing. And, it, and, the, and the governor of Georgia says, no foul, no fraud, nothing to see here. The law says you've got to have two observers. How can they've drunk the cup of madness? Madness is what's gone on here. You've got footage of other people where the ballots are supposed to be scanned so that there's an unbroken chain of custody. Well, just yesterday, you had people with a mobile phone walking past the UPS thing and saw this guy loading ballot boxes into a UPS truck and no scan, nothing. So he begins filming. So what do they do? They put up a cardboard box so they couldn't see it. So what did he have? He must have had an old selfie stick. So he lifted up high and made filmed over the top. You've got all this stuff, but what are they all saying? Nothing to see here, nothing to see th here. Thousands of affidavits that are going through saying we witnessed absor uh, and observed fraud. We saw these things under threat of perjury. And what are they saying? Nothing to see here, nothing to see here. They've drunk the cup of madness is what they've cup. They're drinking this cup of madness. Where does it start? Where does it start? Let's go uh, to... Um, Book of Romans. Let's let's see the, the transition here for the cup of madness that occurs. Okay. And uh, it says this. God is plain in verse 20 of the first chapter of Romans. It says this. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Listen, is God a mystery? No, you go to every discovery that was made in, in antiquity. You wander through some jungle somewhere and you cut down all the going through the Amazon and you find this little thing of pygmies in there. Were any of them saying, oh no, sorry, we don't believe in any God whatsoever. All of them have a little stone monument here somewhere or they're burning candles. They, they all know there's a God out there. God and man go together like uh, love and marriage. You know, horse and carriage, whatever that, that thing was. There was nobody ever found that had no God. They all had a God. And God says here, my attributes are clearly seen. They all know it. They look and see creation up here. Because they can be understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, it says, so that they're without excuse. Because although they knew God, they do not glorify him as God, were, th were thankful but, or thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they become fools. Because what has the fool said in his heart? There is no God. Okay? Professing to be wise, they become fools and change the glory of God. So when you wander out at night, you're doing the hosing, you look up, I do. And I say, God, what a marvelous universe you've created here. You know, little frog climbing up. I squirted him with the hose, and he jumped and attacked me. How's that for a frog? <laughs> hey, that must be Arnie. I'm going to take him on, man. He did it twice, the little thing, you know? Boom. But anyway, you look up, you say, this is marvelous, God. That's the glory of God. But they exchange it into corruptible things. What do they change it into? And you have the progression here. Birds, four-footed animals, and creeping things. The first madness that came upon our world that has been is evolution. Now, you would think they say to us, you're religious, you're a nutter. You believe that there's some power here that you can't see, but we say we've got evidence. We've got archaeology evidence. We've got historical evidence. We've got original manuscripts. We've got people who they, that just said it was an inspired script. And we've got pro prophecy that we can prove that, that, that there's something out there. And they say, you're a bunch of nutters. But for evolution, 
in our generation, how do we know? Because before with Darwin, who knew? Not so many digs. We're going to find all these intermediary forms and all this sort of stuff. What do we find? In our generation, Sir Francis Crick finds this huge volume of information that is unexplainable called DNA. We all know about it now, but it was a miraculous discovery. That if you could put all the information that's in a single cell in DNA and write it into a book, do you know the books would go from here to the moon and back nine times? God crams this into a tiny cell. But the book is useless. If I had Reuben there and I said, Reuben, here's the Bible. This is a wonderful book. You have a look at that. What's he going to do? He'll suck on the pages. <laughs> It's no good having information. You need something that can read it. So you've then got DNA, which is the information, but then you've got RNA that you need to read it. This is a complete system. Any scientist, you go to every other faculty on a university and you say, here, I found, I walked into a cave, and this has been done. They, they walk into a cave somewhere in China and they see a little square with a thing through that. And they say... That's Chinese. How do you know? They know the word because the pictograph. It's, it, well, how do you know the rain didn't just carve that out on the side there? Or, or some bird went in, or, or a chimpanzee, or some lion thought, I'll just scratch something here. How do you know? No, they see the, the, the little indistinct markings on a cave and they say, we know there were men here. Just a little skerrick of information and we know they were here. This is the site where the Chinese, the Sin people were here. We know because of the marking. What a discovery. But they, saw, they find three billion bits of information and something that can read three billion bits of information and organise it into the cell and they say this. We're not sure, it just sort of come out of the, the muck and the mire somewhere and, uh, you know, and every other faculty you go to the information scientist and you say, I got this program, I woke up this morning and there was something on my USB that I'd never seen before, can you plug it in? They plug it in and here's Windows 10 operating system that just comes up working immaculately. They don't say, well far out, that must have been the cockroaches. <laughs> Or maybe a bit of rust on the end of the USB pin. They say, man, who was the programmer there? Because what that is, is that, that's, a, that's a system that's been designed. We know that it's precise. Whoever designed that had a great understanding of the operating system. That's what they say. And then you'll go over to the English faculty and you'll say, well, it's, I've printed out all the code. What do you reckon to these? Oh, yeah, all those letters are recognisable and we know that. And then you'll go to another faculty, the maths faculty, and they'll say, yeah, we can understand the formulas that are in there in that code. That's absolutely, who designed that? That's really intelligent, very, very clever. Then you go to the biology department and the biology department says, no, no, it probably grew on the back of crystals. That is literally what they say. Now, for any rational thinking person, the Bible declares that the attributes of God can be clearly seen. You look at it and we are without excuse. We are a unique generation because we know more than any man that has gone before us beside Adam before the fall. We know more than anybody. God holds us without excuse. But in our day, we say there is no God. But we know there is a God. We are without excuse. They drank the first sip of that cup back there, but that was seminal. From what comes from that is where we are today. So let's go through that. I don't want to hold you for too long. Okay. So they. Um, so what happens after we go through this? And, and birds, four-footed animals, creeping things, all the bits of evolution. They reckon we come from these things. They exchange the glory of God, the intricacy of design, and they say, no, 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 we're just ape with better DNA. That's all we are. Okay, therefore, what's God's response to this? He gives time for repentance. He gives time for the arguments to play out. But as we come to the end of times... Things come quicker. Judgment comes quicker. 
And I told you, I do think Australia has crossed the Rubicon. I've stopped praying for revival in Australia. We uh, simply could stay the hand before judgment falls. That's what I believe. That's not necessarily what you need to believe. But I believe God gave me that for this country, which I wept. Therefore, God gives them what? To uncleanness. So then we have the 70s, after all this stuff breaks loose. What comes? The sexual revolution. We've got uncleanness. The lust of their, their hearts. Uh, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. So we start off with extra, you know, before, in the 50s, even people who hated themselves were married for life. They hated each other. They might have put themselves through the wall, they did all this sort of stuff, but you stayed married. You played up on the side, whatever, but marriage meant something, we stayed. And if you were not married, it was a dishonor and a disgrace going further back. But, so we went from there to free love. Hey, sleep around with everybody, chuck all the keys in the hat, let's have a swingers party. Woo! And off we go. And then we don't need to be married and all this. This is uncleanness, okay, according to God. But from there, then we go another step. And you've got to think about these steps, how quickly they're coming, okay? Evolution all starts, Darwinism starts way back. Then we have in the 1970s, we have this revolution that's going on. Then they exchange, there's a willful exchange here of the truth of God for the lie. And they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. We've gone, evolution was one thing. But in our day and age, where are we? We call them tree huggers. But has climate change ever been such a powerful force? But in our day, we exchange the creator, but what they embrace? Creation. We are the custodians of the garden. Not God. He's not going to sustain this thing. It's not his glory. It's man's glory. Therefore, we've got to look after this thing, and therefore, you've got to lose all your rights because we've got to worship creation. We've got to keep creation going. So we go through that. Okay. Then comes from that. Now, we've seen this in our day, haven't we? We've gone from fornication, free love, 60s, 70s. Then we've gone from there, we've gone to uh, broken marriages, sex outside marriage, not so much marriage, divorces, all this sort of stuff going on freely, no problems, no fault divorce, all this sort of stuff. Then we go from there to the, the greenie movements born, uh, you know, all this sort of stuff going on. Now, then it goes this, for this reason, God gives them up to what we've got now is not passions, like we had in the 60s and the 70s, but we've got vile passions. And I don't care, I'll go to jail. I will go to jail. If this all gets passed, I'll go to jail. That's where I'll be. So, vile passions. I may as well speak freely. It's vile passions is what it is. Okay? For even, it says, <laughs> men filthy. So, but he says, for even the women will exchange the natural use of, their, of what is against nature. And then likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them up to what mind? What is it? A debased, what is that? It's the cup of madness. That's what's coming. They start down a path, we go evolution, we go sexual revolution, we go climate uh, worship of creation, creation worship, let's go with that. I'm all for being a steward in the garden. <laughs> We're not worshipping any trees. Right? We have dominion in these things. We go from creation worship. Then the last is vile passions. And at the vile passion stage, he says, I'm going to give them over and I'm going to give them the cup, which Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah. I'm going to give them what? A cup of madness. And that's where we are. This thing has played out. Homosexual rights has played out. But we've gone beyond. It was homosexual. Remember the old AIDS crisis, 1987? All the AIDS thing. All, all madness again. 
this is not a sexual, AIDS is not a, you know, a sexually transmitted disease and all this sort of stuff. We've got to be, you know, uh, of course, 99% of them were homosexuals that had it at the start. But anyway, just like God said, the penalty in their own bodies. But they refuse to repent. They refuse to come back from this thing. They refuse to say, oh, wouldn't it just be better if we followed God's laws? No, they do refuse to retain God. So God, when we go through this sequence, God gives them the cup of madness at the end of this thing. And in the cup of madness, that's where we are now. What does science say? Science says this. <laughs> the most basic thing. In the first book of the Bible... It's seminal. God says, I made them male and female. And they refused to even acknowledge that. They refused. They come up with 96, oh, there's probably more than that now, 96 genders. I couldn't even make the permutations. How are you going to come up with 96 genders? For me, it's simple. You go to a hospital, you see a naked baby laying on the table, and you look down. It's a boy or it's a girl. I'm not a smart man, but that's as basic as it is for me. I look down and I say that. And science, if you go to a biology department, despite their previous madness, and you say to them, now I want you to tell me how many, not genders there are, how many sexes there are. They have to say to you, it's a little bit gray, but scientifically, there's only male and female. But because we've drunk the cup of madness, there is X, Y, X, X. There's, here's another gender. Uh, here's another one. Uh, here's another one. They don't know. There's no scientific basis on any of this rubbish whatsoever. Everything else is between here. It's a creation. It's a mental derangement is what it is. In fact, you go back through the old psychiatric uh, 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 handbooks and they diagnose, even back seminally, vile passions, as in homosexuality, as a mental illness that needs to be treated. But they won't go back to that, so because they won't, we end up with the cap of madness where we don't know who's who in the zoo. We don't know, are you Mrs. Jones or Mr. Jones or Mrs. Jones or just Jones or you're just, what are you? And, and I can be in trouble for not using the correct pronoun for you. There was an actor, the actress that came out just recently and cha said she's just come out as a bloke. Well, she looks like a woman. She hasn't changed anything. But between her ears, she's now a bloke. So you're supposed to say to her, when you see her, hello, Mr. whatever your name is. Now, if you're not confused, there's something wrong with you. Because if you're confused, you're sitting here saying, am I mad or is this world mad? Are you like that? You are like a viewer on the world thinking, are they crazy or am I crazy? I want to tell you this. Jesus Christ gives us a special gift. It's called a sound mind. It's a sound mind, and a sound mind is one that's based on the wisdom of God. And therefore, we shall not succumb to confusion in the world that we're living in, but in that not succumbing, you're dealing, it's like living in a house with a mentally ill person. Now, we've had, I remember this happening once. I remember um, my niece, uh, um, her father, on her father's side, there is some mental illness. Now, Betty, who was a lovely woman, uh, her daughter was Wendy, and on this particular day, not good. So she spent about an hour and a half running around the, Christian, Christmas, uh, the um, dining table while Wendy was chasing her with a knife with the full intent of killing her own mother. This is the cup of madness. But as a Christian in the last days, this is what you'll be living like. Okay? It's like living in a world with mentally ill people because they have drunk the cup of madness. 
you say, Paul, what does this all end up? I wish we, I'd love to be, I don't want to speak on this sort of rubbish, but this is a unique time. It seems like a week goes and they come up with something so big and profound that you can't, I can't talk to you on love and kindness and, and purity and the gifts of the Spirit when this is on the table. This is a game changer for all of us. And so we've got to address it. Where does it end up? Let's turn in our books to Re uh, Revelation chapter 17. And this is the end of it though. But I tell you, it's this world that we're living in, for many years to be a Christian, we were respected. Is that right? You go back 150 years ago, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, if you said you're a Christian, they were happy to employ you. You're an honest man. You know what I mean? We took you at your word. Your word meant something. You were almost a cut above. They might have been godless people that got drunk every night, but if they dealt with a Christian, you know, they would say things like, you're a good Christian man. You know what I mean? There was a set of values that was esteemed. We've gone from that to we'll put up with it, to now where they say we can't stand it. We will not have these values forced upon us and we will not allow you to teach your children these toxic values. Why is that? Because you're dealing with someone who's mentally ill. They are either demonically animated, they're demonically possessed, but this cup of madness, they are getting drunk with this thing. Okay, that's what Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah 51 told us. Now let's read the end of it. So it goes like this. Then one of the seven angels who had taken the seven bowls came and talked with me saying, this is the judgment. Remember we read in Jeremiah, they, he gives them the cup, the golden cup he puts it in the hands of the nations. Then when he's drunk, then it says quickly in Jeremiah 51, it says Babylon is fallen. Quickly after that, there's a judgment that comes. Okay, let's keep that in mind. Okay, and it says this, come and I will show you the, the judgment, verse 1, of the great harlot who sits on many waters, nations that is, okay, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Same idioms that we're talking about, drunk with the wine, this cup, okay. So he carried away in the spirit of the wilderness and I saw the woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names and blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand, what does she have? The golden cup that's in Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah 51. And what is it full of? It's full of don't want God, don't want sexual restraint, loving the planet, got to save the planet under my own strength and power, and it's filled with abominations. Vile passions is what it's full with. And the filthiness of her fornication, okay? And on her forehead, forehead was a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Listen, fulfillment, verse 6. I saw the woman drunk, same as, Isaiah, same as Jeremiah, with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. What the end of this, I'd love to tell you something different. I'd love to tell you a uh, Cinderella story where all goes well. But at the end of this cup of madness is an outright, what Daniel calls, the war with the saints. And unfortunately, they will prevail for a time. We need to be wise. We've got to understand the times in which we're living. Now, I'm not telling you to do anything or whatever, but what I am saying is this cup of madness is not going away. This cup of madness is going to, the more they drink of this cup, the more it's going to cause these abominations of legislations that are going to come through, that are going to put you in a box somewhere. Hello, we've got a joining. Hello, big tiger. How are you? We've got this going on. It's not going to get better. What I've got to tell you is we're going back to where this word of God will be outlawed. There'll be an apostate one. You can preach all the nice little baby Jesus coming on Christmas Day and, you know, here he is in the straw manger. But if you want to preach the word of God, it's going to be like a famine. 
we need to start storing up now. I believe that the coming of the Lord is imminent. I do believe that. I, will not, I, I firmly believe in my heart, I'm 50 years age, I will not die before the Lord comes. The way, the speed that this is coming at. And so I don't know what you believe. And I might be out of line. Maybe I'm just reacting. I've seen some of my old stuff where I thought the same thing. Maybe I'm just reacting to what's happening here. But I see things coming faster and 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 faster. And, faster. and this is what I know. I know in the Old Testament you've got over 300 prophecies about the coming of the Lord Jesus. And most of those were fulfilled in the last 50 years uh, leading up to his appearing. And most of those were fulfilled in the last 33 years. And most of those were fulfilled in the last week of his life. And most of those prophecies were fulfilled in the last hours of his life. This thing goes like a train at the end. And I, I don't know how you feel, but how I feel is like it's, you're on the caboose. And this train is out of control without a driver. Do you feel that way? Do you feel like things are just getting pulled on? You can't settle somewhere and think, oh, thank God, that's all. We're off again, you know what I mean? And off we go. This train is a runaway train. But at the end of it, do not be surprised. This is what's coming, is that they're going to, she's going to be so drunk at the end here, but she makes war with those who will not, will, who will refuse not to have God in their thinking. If you want to pursue God and what His word and His word means something to you, then the, you're going to have war declared on you. In fact, it's already been declared on you. To pray in your own home or to pray with someone who's seeking help becomes a crime. Is that being a terror to evildoers or is that being a terror to Jesus followers? And when you specifically list out examples, as this legislation does, about prayer, who are you targeting? Because I guarantee you, you won't be going into a mosque telling them they can't pray three times a day. You may go in, you won't come out. <laughs> so it's targeting one group of people. The war has begun on the saints. I just want to tell you this. Jesus says this, please do not be terrified because I fight with myself. I go from anger that our country has gone from the state that it was to where it is now and then from there you can vacillate over to fear to say what's coming I'm thinking I could be in jail they passed this legislation someone in Victoria looks at one of my teachings I could be in jail for 10 years I won't pay the fine I don't care what the fine is they can find me I'll just do it again so what's the point paying the fine I'll be off to jail what, what crime have you done? Well, there's other little fellas getting around here that commit crime after crime after crime. Nothing happens to them. This is hatred. This is demonic. This is satanic is what's going on. But I want to say this. Jesus himself said these words to you. When you see these things, don't let your heart be troubled. I've gone to prepare a place for you that where I am you may be also. Don't be troubled. He says when you see these things, he says do one thing. Look up, your redemption draweth nigh. So my cry of my heart is this, Maranatha. Maranatha, Lord, come. Lord, come. I'm looking, this, look, please do not fold. Do not sell yourself out in Christianity. Stay the course. Keep faithful to Jesus because this event, this war lasts a short time. So it will think, you'll think, Meg, this is, you know, will anyone survive this? But I tell you what, Jesus will keep those. And who he doesn't keep, I, I say this, and I said it to you before, I say this, if Lord, if I don't trust myself, if you know that if they take me, put me in jail, threaten me with death, if I'm going to fold, kill me before I get there. I don't want to forfeit my salvation because I want to preserve my flesh. If I'm going to be one of the ones who can't make it, kill me, kill me early. That will be a mercy God. But other than that, it says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. And there will be obviously those that are going to get raptured. 
So in the one sense, God will do miraculous things to hide his own. But there is no question. I mean, there were miraculous stories. You think of um, Germany in Hitler's time which is where we're going. Socialism is, is, I mean, these things are socialist policies that are going on, getting propagated. Well, always there are stories of miraculous escape. You know, you go to Israel and you've got a, a, a walkway there where they plant trees to Gentiles, the righteous Gentiles, they call it, you know, because they helped the Jews escape and there were those that got out. But the reality is the ones that get out a minor to the ones that got caught. And so that's the reality that we're facing. I say, God, if I can't make it, kill me. I want to, exactly. To get shot would be a blessing. There's worse ways to die naturally. Other than that, keep me supernaturally. And if you're like me, John, you've got young kids and all that sort of stuff, that's what I'm saying. Lord, give me wisdom. It says if when they begin to persecute you, don't be a hero, he says flee. So we need to be wise. Devices in our homes, things that may catch us, what you say to certain people, be wise. I will be over the next, um, you know, over the Christmas break, I'll be reevaluating. If this thing gets through, I've got to think about what I'm putting on the, net, on the web. Is what I'm putting on the web worth it for the people that are out there? Is it really making a difference? Or am I just tooting my own horn on there? Because the, the risk of someone that they go after, I could go to jail. In, I don't know how Victoria can legislate for people outside of Victoria, but that's what this is doing. So someone in Victoria gets affected, I go to jail. So we've got to be wise. We've got to be wise as serpents in the age that we're living in, harmless as doves, but wise as serpents. These are things we need to think about because society is turning against us. But if the Lord before us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? Ultimately, we win. Ultimately, we win. But we need the wisdom of God. And I tell you what else we need. We need each other. We need each other. I well, thank you for your word last night. That's great encouragement to me. We need that. You come here. I thank you for your word this morning. Great encouragement to me. We need the words of Jesus. We need each other. You're not going to exist by yourself. You're not going to exist as stuck on a shag on a rock. God will hold you if you're isolated, stuck in a jail somewhere. God will keep you. There's no doubt about that. He'll be chained beside you. No problem with that. But other than that, we need each other. We need the encouragement of each other. We need the wisdom of each other. What do you think about this? What about that? Did you hear about this? You've got things. We need each other. And above all, we need Jesus. We need Jesus. He knows what's best for us. So don't, don't let your heart be troubled. That's the natural response. But look up and say, I say this is exciting. Jesus is coming soon. And we will rule and reign with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There you go, John. You could be legislating for Jesus. He might give you Lake Tarpo. Uh -huh. hey? You could be the mayor of Lake Tarpo. Amy may have something else. You know, she might be uh, Queenstown but we'll all be ruling and reigning with Jesus. But there's a time that we've got to get, we've got to get through the birth pains and labor before we get the delivery of the child. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. God, I pray, God, that old song comes to mind. I need thee every hour, I need thee. Fill me now, Lord Jesus. I come to thee. Let's sing it. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need Thee, come fill me now, my Saviour. I come to Thee, I need Thee, oh, I need Every hour I need thee, come fill me now, my Savior, I come to thee. Father, I thank you, Lord. 
God, let us count it all joy when these tribulations come upon us. God, that we're counted worthy to suffer for you, Lord. That should be our greatest joy that we can be counted like you. Give us the mind that was in Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.